This morning we continue our journey into the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, this morning what we are going to talk about is more of an application of what we learned uh, yesterday. The deep philosophy that we discover, uh, discovered and discussed yesterday, that we are going to see how it plays out in life. So there are two talks. The first one is called The Power of Choice, and it will become very clear why I named it that. And the next one is the result of all of this. If you ever wondered what it is like to be enlightened, what will I be like when I am enlightened, uh, then the last talk is going to talk about that, living in freedom. So in this talk, we'll start off by discussing what Houston Smith uh, mentioned when he started his chapter on Hinduism in his book, Religions of the World. I mentioned this yesterday, that when Houston Smith started his chapter on Hinduism, which is the first chapter in his book, The Religions of the World, he said one way of understanding Hinduism is that you can have whatever you want. <clears throat> whatever you want, you're going, to have, you're going to get it. But then that raises the great question of what do we want really in life? And Hindu thinkers over the ages have systematized human wants into, into four, four categories, four goals, four pursuits of human life. These terms are very well known in India, and people uh, can rattle them off without actually knowing what they mean, even thinking about what they mean. Uh, dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Literally, they translate into, Kama translates into uh, the search for pleasure. Kama is a search for pleasure. Artha literally means wealth, but the search for success, power, achievement, wealth, status, all of that. And then you go into dharma, which, which is a term very difficult to define. It's, uh, if you see the dictionary, it will have a page full of meanings. Uh, but it means morality, righteousness, um, uh, the right thing to do, uh, the, uh, it means religion. So all of that is covered under dharma. Literally the word dharma comes from the root dri. Dri means to hold together. So that which holds a thing together is its dharma. So that which gives us integrity, that which makes us us, is our dharma. Um, beyond that lies moksha. More of that later. Let me put that scheme on the board here. So we have um, karma, which means pleasure. Remember, there is no normative content in this. That's, what it means is that the teachers are not saying that you should pursue this. They're just saying that we do. It's a fact. People pursue this. That's just, that's just who we are. Karma is the pursuit of pleasure in all its forms. And uh, then. Uh, there is Artha. One meaning is possessions, wealth, so literally wealth, but everything else. Wealth, etc. If you want to build your own business, that's the pursuit of Artha. It may not just be for the money, it may be for the very challenge of doing something big and powerful. And then there is Dharma. Um, which can be translated as, as morality. I will uh, translate it for our purposes today as conventional religion. And I'll talk about what I mean later. Conventional religion. And then moksha. Spirituality. <coughs> Spiritual freedom, let's say. Moksha literally means freedom. And I'll draw a line between them. All right. And we should really read Houston Smith's book. You know, he uh, takes up each one and spends some time on that. And he says, search for pleasure comes naturally to us. When we want to be happy, the first thing that we do is food, comfort food or a comfortable environment, or the company of friends, or go out for a walk on the, uh, on the beach. Not today, it's going to be a very hot day. I, I heard. So, 
whatever is pleasant and nice uh, and sensuous, that's pleasure. But pleasure has some, um, some problems associated with it. Uh, psychologists have talked about it. There's a whole branch now called positive, positive <coughs> psychology. Uh, Seligman talks about it. Pleasure is, first of all, it's transient. Even the nicest <coughs> chocolate chip cookie, it lasts for a few seconds on your, on your tongue. The, the pleasurable sensations are only for a few seconds. Even, <coughs> he says, uh, Houston Smith says, the finest products of our civilization from time immemorial, even Bach and Beethoven, uh, uh, when you listen to that, the classical music, the, the most elevated, subtle, uh, evolved forms of pleasure, even after all of that, after you enjoy that, you still feel that was nice, but is that all that there is to life? That's all? Is it over? You ask, isn't, can't there be anything more than this? Somerset Mom, whom I had occasion to mention yesterday, she says that... Uh, if you chase pleasure single-mindedly, very soon you will find nothing pleasing anymore. If you party single-mindedly, after one or two days you'll be disgusted with everything, all of that. So pleasure has its limitations. Beyond pleasure is the seeking for achievement in life. It could be money, it could be learning, it could be anything, some kind of achievement, status, power, um, in life. So that is artha. And beyond that is what I call uh, conventional religion. Now there are those who are addicted only to pleasure. But such lives are usually uh, very frustrating and, ve and very soon ironically self-defeating because they become unhappy. In search for happiness through pleasure they become unhappy very fast. We look at the classic example, extreme example would be addicts. Those who are addicted to alcohol or drugs or something, some form of addiction. And they, what are they seeking there? They're basically seeking for pleasure. And now then it has become a strong habit which they cannot break out of. Um, Sri Ramakrishna used to tell this story about a man standing on the bank of a river in the villages in India. And the river is in full spate. It's a flood. And uh, this man sees something like an expensive rug being swept away on the flood, uh, flood tide of the river. And he thinks, what a shame, why should it go to waste? So he jumps into the river and struggles mightily to swim up to that rug. And when he swims up to it, he discovers it's a bear being swept away by the flood waters. <laughs> and of course the bear gives him what bears do, a bear hug, and holds on to him. <laughs> and people standing on the shore, they don't know that. They see this man being swept away and he's sort of struggling with a rug, what seems to be a rug. And they shout to him, let the rug go. Let the rug go. You'll be swept up, you'll be drowned. And the man shouts back, I'll let it go, it doesn't let go of me. <laughs> That's what addiction is. <laughs> it's a bear which you hold you and doesn't let, let you go afterwards, when, even when you want to let it go. Now, that is very short-sighted and, and the pleasure from that is very short-lived, the happiness from that is very short-lived. But more happiness comes from this one. Uh, Seligman again, he calls it engagement. Where you are engaged in, it could be your career, it could be a hobby. It's not pleasurable. It, it, it gives you some pleasure, but it may not always be pleasurable. If, if uh, for example, a, a surgeon who does hours and hours of surgery, and after that, it's not pleasurable. It's really hard work. But after that, if you ask that person, he says, it's very satisfying. Now that satisfaction comes from this, from, from this level, your activity, your engagement. It, is not, it does not come from here. The difference between the two is like, if you sit on the couch and watch a game on TV, passive enjoyment, that's pleasure. But if you go out there and play the game yourself with some friends, maybe you're not playing at the level you see on TV. You're not playing at that level. But Definitely the satisfaction is more when you are actually engaged physically, mentally, you're, you're challenged and you're engaged in this game. So that's the difference. It's active. It engages all our capacities. So often work does that. And if you are lucky enough to find work which challenges you, which gives you satisfaction, so that gives more happiness than pleasure. And then 
add to this mix the morality, decency, doing something for others beyond our little the circle of our little self. You see, both of these are in some sense selfish because they sort of are around, centered around the self. But when we try to break out of the self and do something for others, a greater cause, social action for something, um, or uh, doing something for others, or religion also, that gives another level of satisfaction, another level of happiness. Let me give you an example. Many of my friends whom we studied, we studied together, so they, they didn't become monks. I'm the only one who did, but they went on to uh, have jobs and uh, a family and so on. And years later, one or two of them, when, we, when I come across them, and not only them, people of their age, you know, in the 30s or early 40s, one question they sometimes ask is, now I have got this job, I have a family, I have kids, I sort of have the sense that this is what my life is going to be for the next 20, 30 years, 20 years maybe, <coughs> until the kids grow up, until I retire out of my present job. So is this all? Is that all? Because there is, I've seen, I feel locked in, that there is um, nothing more to this. Than, this is nice, I'm not unhappy, but uh, then this seems to be the end of life, because in one sense, this is what it's going to be until the kids grow up, until I retire out of my job, then I'll be old and I'll get sick and I'll die. <laughs> so I can sort of see it. Is that all? And I'm not really happy with this. Not happy with this situation. Now you can see what that person lacks is this, the next component. So I just say to them, it's very good that you have the family and the kids and uh, um, your job and your career and your hobbies. Now, take one more step. Look out to the community. Do something for others. For others who cannot do anything in return for you. If they do something in return for you, it comes back to the level of artha. Expand beyond the little self. All in the pursuit of happiness. All in the pursuit of happiness. And it works. It works. You see, one of the tragedies of our uh, modern society is when we are seeking happiness, all society seems to tell us is this, these two. Look at the advertisements on TV. You are happy, you, you drink this drink, this, this um, fizzy drink, you'll be happy. Because they're all happy, they're all grinning, they're all uh, shiny and happy. And most of them are young, unfortunately. They're, they're, that's a, every, so it's a young person's word. And then... Um, you, this gadget makes you happy, iPhone 6 makes you happy, it doesn't make you happy, then iPhone 7 is there for you. <laughs> so, this vacation uh, in, in Florida, if you want more than that, then you have a vacation in Hawaii. So, what our modern society seems to say is, if you have got some of Artha and Kama, and you want more than this, then the only alternative seems to be more of Artha and Kama, different kinds of pleasure and, uh, and uh, wealth and achievement. The, the variations of this, different permutations and combinations of this, this doesn't seem to be anybody telling people that there is something beyond this. So, there is something beyond this, where you expand beyond the, the, the confines of the little self. In fact, unselfishness makes you more happy than selfishness. Swami Vivekananda says this, but it takes maturity to understand this. Sharing makes you happier than consuming everything yourself. It's like a mother who has got this pie she's baked and uh, the kids are coming home from school and there's only this one or two pieces left. Now does she think, before the kids come home, let me eat it because they're going to eat it. Uh -huh. So let me, let me finish it up first. Is, is that what she thinks? Or she thinks, I'll wait for them and, and then I'll give them this, the last two pieces of pie. What will make her happier? The second thing makes her happier. Because she loves them and she really wants them to be happy, their happiness is magnified in her happiness. And she doesn't think that I'll be happy if I eat it all. So in the same way, expanding beyond the confines of the little self gives you some more happiness. And this is more or less the range of happiness 
the range of life as we know it. Why have I called it conventional religion? There's a reason for that. Here, religion, God, whatever you call it, the purpose of that is to make our lives a little happier. Let my family be healthy. Let me retain my job. If I get fired, let me find another job very fast. Let me find, I mean, everything from uh, satisfaction and peace and, and security in this life down to a nice parking spot or whatever. All of that, God is supposed to help us to make our lives better. Mass religion is like that. Whether you go to church or a temple, most people are going there because God will help me to make my life a little better. I'm not really going, people are not really going there for enlightenment or to become the Buddha or to get, get um, moksha, liberation. No. They would very much like to continue with the life they have got, but it just must be that much better. God will help me to solve the problems, my financial problems, my relationship problems, uh, parking problems, what have you. So all those problems, God will solve. I keep talking about parking because uh, I'm in Manhattan now and, and <laughs> that's the prime complaint I get from the people who come to the Vedanta Society there. We don't get parking. So God will help me to do all, the, all of this makes my life better and if God does not if God does not fulfill the role we have assigned for God then we say when he's fired <laughs> people, you come across people I don't believe in God anymore I prayed and prayed and prayed and there's no response it's just superstition so God was supposed to help me to make my life more comfortable God did not so God is fired I, he's, he's laid off <laughs> that's conventional religion you see, God is for my present life to make it better, to help me. Spirituality is something different, which we go, go later on to spirituality. Something different, where my life is for God. God is not for this life. God is not one more thing I add. I, I need pleasure, I need uh, wealth, and I need God. All of this goes to make this life better. No. The whole thing becomes a search, a spiritual search, the big questions in life. What is the purpose of life? Is there God or any kind of ultimate reality at all? Do I at all exist in any form after death? What's the point of this entire game? When you ask these big questions, you're asking spiritual questions. And if your life is devoted to that, if your pursuit, if your central pursuit in life is that spiritual quest, then you are a spiritual seeker. When you are what is called in Sanskrit sadhaka, a spiritual practitioner. So there is a big difference. In Vedanta they say that the conventional life is this, a search for this. When Houston Smith said, what do you want? Hinduism says you can get what you want. Do you want this? There is one word for all of this. It's called samsara. Life in this world. You exist, you're happy, you're miserable, and you do muddle along the best you can, and then we die, and then we go on to other lives. And we repeat the whole thing in numerous variations. And this goes on and on. As long as you are in that, basically you want these things. Samsara. But a point comes when the soul matures, when this uh, person, the individual we are, in Sanskrit it's called Jiva, we seek for something ultimate, something permanent, something eternal. We want to know the reality behind the game. We don't enjoy the magic show anymore. anymore. We want to meet the magician. There's a very evocative story I read uh, where it describes a party. You're, everybody's invited to a party, people are coming into a, it's a mansion. And lots of entertainment and food. And people are coming in there, they meet each other and they, they gossip and they have a good time. There is music and there is dancing. And then what the person, the narrator, he is also invited to the party. And he says, it's evening, the night falls fast. It is time for us to go. Many people came to the party, many have departed, others are coming. But night is coming and I must go back. I wish I could have met the owner of the mansion. Who invited us to this party? Who is the person? What, who is behind all of this? 
And that's all stands for God, actually, the ultimate reality. The party is this world. So when you seek that, you are seeking moksha. You're seeking enlightenment. You're seeking salvation, whatever you call it, nirvana. A mature soul seeks that. An immature soul seeks these. A very, very immature soul seeks only this pleasure. A little more mature soul seeks success and pleasure. And that's the majority of people in the world today. Success. I want to have a good time and I want to be successful. The two go together. So that's the, the most people. And a little more enlightened person. The people we think are decent, God-fearing, good people in this, uh, in this society. The backbone of civilization. They want all of them. They want... They want pleasure also. They want to have a good time. They want, um, uh, they want engagement in life, a satisfying work, something to contribute to society, make something of your life. But they also want to be good people and contribute to society and, and move beyond limits. Often you will find very, very rich people, especially in this country, they become uh, philanthropists. You know, it's a natural progression. Unless you do that, with a tremendous amount of wealth and there's nothing more to do in life, and it becomes meaningless. There's a, st a short story I read somewhere about a millionaire. In those days, millionaires were big things. So now billionaires are big things. <laughs> I remember driving through Manhattan. The person who was driving me, a gentleman, he said, you know, that particular apartment building, a huge high-rise, a skyscraper, do you know it's a prime location and people do not know this? In that building there are 34 billionaires. Mm. Apartments and uh, penthouses which they have. 34 billionaires. <coughs> now, beyond that, the, one, once one reaches that, one must expand beyond oneself. Otherwise, the only result is, is uh, suicide. The story which I read was, there's a millionaire who finally commits suicide and in a suicide note, he shoots himself. And he write, in a suicide note, he writes, I, the excitement has gone out of life. The only, the last thing I found which could be exciting is killing myself. I wanted to get a kick out of life. <laughs> there's, there's nothing else. So the, so the only way he got kicked out of life is by killing himself. If you don't want to end up like that, one must expand beyond that. So one becomes um, a philanthropist, does something for others. But... When one sees through all of this and seeks spirituality, then one is looking for moksha. Now, the point of today's topic, the power of choice, is for people like us, definitely the spiritual question has awakened, in whatever form. The choice must now be deliberately made. Who am I? Oh, I am Brahman, I know that, that's, that's the ultimate thing. But right now, as this individual person, how do I define myself? Where am I seeking satisfaction? Am I seeking satisfaction in partying? Am I seeking satisfaction in wealth? Am I seeking satisfaction in social service? What is central? You may go on with all of this, and do go on with all of this, but is it central to your life? Is it central to your life? I'll like illustrate what I mean. Mahatma Gandhi, he says, in one place in his autobiography, when people ask me who I am, people think that I'm a politician. Some people think I'm a politician, fighting for India's freedom. Some people think that I'm a, uh, I do social service. I'm, I'm trying to reform Indian society, a social reformer. But if you ask me, who am I? I will say I'm a simple man in search of God. You see, what is this, the central theme of his life to him? He says, I am searching for God. And the way he's searching for God is religion, is social ac activism, is political activism, the great issues of the day during his time. That becomes his spiritual practice. But his central quest is a spiritual quest. It's not politics. It's not certainly not pleasure. It's not, as I said, Gandhiji was famously austere. When he went to meet the Viceroy in London, he went with his dhoti and a little shawl around him. And uh, I think he meant, yes, uh, not the Viceroy, I think he met, uh, met uh, King, George. King George, yes, King George. And the reporter asked him afterwards, George. do you think... George, like no, 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 oh. uh, King George. So um, the reporter asked him, 
Mr. Gandhi, do you think you are appropriately dressed to meet the king? And he replied, well, the king wore enough for both of us. <laughs> he was, was in all his regalia and his medals and everything. So Gandhi was, was not seeking for happiness from having a pleasure or, or a good time or partying in the world. And the social causes, the political causes he pursued, even that was not central to him. He said, I'm not all about India's freedom. I'm not all about reforming uh, caste and other problems in Indian society. No, I'm all about finding God. That's a spiritual seeker. Continuing with the business of life, but essentially a spiritual seeker. That's the choice that we have to make. Where do we fall? We are all, because we are here, we are definitely we belong to this category, but we must consciously admit it to ourselves. Otherwise, what happens is the habits of a lifetime keep sweeping us along these tracks. And we get confused. That confusion should be removed. Who am I? I am a simple person in search of God. I am a simple person in search of God. Simplicity is important. Swami Vivekananda says, combine utmost seriousness with childlike simplicity. Combine utmost seriousness. What is utmost seriousness? The greatest seriousness you can have in life is the pursuit of spirituality. There is no more serious quest than this. All the questions of politics and science and art and nature, they all fall far below this. The ultimate question in life, the pursuit, this is the greatest adventure, the spiritual adventure. So utmost seriousness will bring you to this in some form, a spiritual quest. Combine utmost seriousness with a childlike simplicity. You see, we do just the opposite. Our lives are greatly superficial or utterly superficial. And inside we are very complex. We combine superficiality with complexity. Inside a lot of complexity. And the way we lead our lives is superficial. Swami Vivekananda says, reverse it. Be very simple. A childlike simplicity inside. But your whole life is utmost seriousness. There is a verse uh, describing Ramakrishna. Shishu Somya Magamya Varam Pranamami Gadadhara Brahma Param. I salute that Parabrahman, that transcendent Brahman who has appeared as Ramakrishna, who combined within him these two qualities. Shishu Somyam, the wholesomeness, the sweetness of a little little child. The purity, the sweetness, the wholesomeness of a little child. And the next next phrase, Agamya Varam who is so awesome that he's, he's virtually unapproachable. Who is re his spirituality is so radiant that it's virtually unapproachable. So the com combination of these two. So this is the choice that I'm speaking about. We have to consciously select this. <coughs> when you consciously select this, you know this thing for which we are wearing, the Gerua which he is wearing, I'm wearing, it just symbolizes one thing. It symbolizes this choice. If I ask you here, what is the goal of your life? Some of you may say something, many of you will be, will sort of hem and haw and people would, you know, in a, in a big gathering, if you ask most people, they'll say, goal, well, I really haven't thought, I'm just sort of muddling through life. Muddling through life is basically this. If you have a particular goal, a, a high goal in life, when you go to Belurmat, the monastery, Anybody, any of the monks you ask there, from the, the young man who has joined the order just yesterday, to a monk who has been there for 50 years, there's one thing common to all of them. If you ask them, what's your goal in life, they will tell you immediately. It is God-realization. Atmano mokshartham jagathitaya cha. That's the goal Swami Vivekananda put forward. It, we really feel that. Our goal is enlightenment and welfare of the world. Enlightenment for yourself and welfare, uh, welfare of the world, that is our goal. So we have already made the choice. This color, it signifies an extraordinary choice. People revere monks. People revere monks and respect monks. The reason is that it's not that we are extraordinary. We are very ordinary people, but we have made an extraordinary choice. We have made this choice, that our purpose is moksha. God realization. This is what we must make. 
all of us, this exercise, this power of choice. That we are seekers after liberation, we are seekers after enlightenment, we are seekers after spiritual freedom. That's what my life is all about. And of course you can continue with the rest of it, you have to. Whether if you are in an ashram, you be like us. Or if you are in a household, you have, to, you have to have a job, you have to take care of your house, you have to take care, you have to fulfill your roles in, in society, that's alright. Now, once we decide this, once we exercise the power of choice and decide we are spiritual seekers, then comes a problem. It's not easy. <laughs> As you were saying yesterday, spiritual seeking, this pursuit seems to have a lot of competition. It's, there seems to be a lot of pull. The world exerts a pull on us. The pull comes from these. What we have left behind, you might say consciously I have left it behind, but it doesn't work so fast. It doesn't work. It's not all that easy. Strong tendencies of our past years, past lives are there, which exert a downward pull. Now that's what we're going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about now is how what we learned yesterday, the, the insight into the real nature of the self, Atma Jnana, self-knowledge, how that can help us in our spiritual quest, in, in our sadhana, in our lives of spiritual practice. For that, let me take you to the Gita, chapter 3, verses from 36 till the end of the chapter, which is 43. As we go through it, at the end of the talk, you will find the link with, between yesterday's talk and, and what we are doing today. But at first, it will seem to be something else. So, the verse 36, Arjuna asks a question to Krishna. A very important question. Let me start with that. Arjuna asks this question. Arjuna vacha athakena prayuktoyam papam charati purusha anichanna pivashneya bala deva niyojita Arjuna asks this question. O Krishna, impelled by what? Instigated by what? Does a person do wrong things? Not wishing to do anything wrong, as if forced along by some force. Baladeva, swept away by force. You see, when we do something wrong and we regret it afterwards, this regret and guilt is a very interesting, fe uh, uh, very interesting emotion. Why is it interesting? Because I did it and now I wish I had not done it. Therefore, it was something interesting. What made me do it? At that point, what made me do it? I feel it's against my values. If it's against my values, if it's, it's below my standard, then why did I do it at all? So that's what he's asking. What makes us, what sweeps us away from our path when we are seeking spiritual, a spiritual goal, enlightenment? What delays us? What holds us back? What continuously sweeps us away from the path? The question that is asked, that Swami, it's all right in the class, in the spiritual retreat, but the moment we step aside and go back home, we go back to our uh, the, the freeway and back home and back to the office, it's all gone. But why is it all gone? I made up my mind, I shall lead my life in this way, and the next moment, within, a few, within the next hour, it's all gone again. Why? That is the question. And this question is crucial. It's a question that every spiritual seeker asks, and a spirit who is not a spiritual seeker will not ask. There's a difference. In the Mahabharata, which this book is from, there's a civil war between the princes of the same family. So the villain of the piece is a prince called Duryodhana, a very villainous man. Now somebody said, Krishna should have gone and taught him the Gita. <laughs> Teach the bad guy, give, give wisdom to the bad guy. And uh, that will help. That will prevent all this chaos and mess and warfare and everything. Why teach the good guy? And Krishna actually tried, you know. The Mahabharata story is that Krishna tried to persuade Duryodhana that uh, he spoke the language of morality. What you're doing is wrong. It's not dharma, it is adharma. And Duryodhana's reply was very interesting. It's exactly this point which Arjuna is saying here, the question which Arjuna raises here, is exactly what Duryodhana raised, but with a twist. 
Duryodhana said to Krishna, O Krishna, don't teach me what is right and what is wrong. I know what is right and what is wrong. That's not my problem. Not knowing right and wrong is not my problem. My problem is, I know what is right. I don't feel like doing it. <laughs> I know what is wrong, but I can't stop myself from doing it. You see, he points to a way, um, the core of a human predicament. He's very honest. He says, Janami dharmam nachame pravritti. I know what is dharma. I don't feel like doing it. There's no tendency in me to, to follow that path. It really doesn't come from within me. Janami adharma nachame nivritti. I know what's wrong. What I'm doing is wrong. But I can't stop myself. I can't help it. Why can't you help it? Then he says, there is some force within me which makes me do these things. I'm just the way, that's the way I am. Kenapi devena hridisthitena yatha niyojito asmi tatha karomi. By some force within me, in my heart, as I'm directed, that's what I do. I'm impelled along this path. I know it's a wrong path. And I'll probably come to a sticky end. But, <laughs> but this is just the way I am. The difference between the Duryodhana, what makes him a villain, and what makes Arjuna the hero, is Duryodhana puts it the same thing as a statement. This is how it is. Arjuna puts this fact as a question. This is what it is, what can I do about it? I want to get out of this, I don't like this. I want to get out of this, I want to follow the spiritual path. But I'm keep, I keep getting swept away. So what is it that's our, that's the problem, that's the obstacle, the enemy in spiritual life, and how do we overcome that? That's the question Arjuna asks, and we look at Krishna's answer. Krishna says, Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Kama Esha Krodha Esha Raja Guna Samudbhava Mahashano Mahapapma Vidhyenam Mihavairinam Desire and anger born of rajas are that force, that force you're talking about, which Duryodhana had mentioned, which Arjuna you are talking about. There is a force and that is desire. And that is anger, born of Rajaguna, which is Mahashana, whose hunger is insatiable. The hunger of desire is insatiable. Mahapapma, it leads you to great error and great sin. Know these to be the enemy. Vidhi enam vairinam. So these are the two. And of these two, anger and desire, desire is central. Because anger is nothing but desire, yes, frustrated, desire frustrated. Anger is just desire frustrated. When we want something and there's a block, something, somebody, some situation prevents it, and then we, we lose our temper, we get irritated. Anytime you're irritated, anytime you're angry, immediately look for what is it which is not the way you want it to be. That's why we get angry. There's something in the situation where uh, it's not according to our desires and therefore we, we get upset. So fundamental is this desire. This desire is this, karma, the same word which is used here, karma yesha. Now, Sri Krishna says, it's not the same for all people. In some cases, this, this layer of desire is light it can be easily removed. In some it is more, it takes effort. And in some it is really thick, it takes a long time. So he, tells, he says this, Dhume na briyate vanhi yatha darsho male na cha yathol be na brito garva tatha te ne dama britam In some cases Krishna says, it's like the fire in, enveloped in smoke. So there's fire and it's enveloped in smoke. A gust of wind is enough to blow away the smoke and reveal the fire in its fiery glory. In the same way, all our spiritual practices, there is a cloud, a miasma of desire around it. A little effort will clear it up. A little clarity will clear it up. A little discipline will clear it up. Just like smoke around a fire. Sometimes it's thicker. 
He says it's like dust on a mirror. Dust on a mirror will not go away by itself or by a little gust of wind. You need to scrub. You need to scrub the mirror. You need to polish the mirror. So in some of our cases, it's, uh, our mind is like that. It's like a mirror with, covered with dust. So the reflection does not come. It does not hold the teaching of Vedanta within it's given. There's a dust of desire over the mirror. In fact, Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda says, we, the only thing that we can do is polish the mirror. In Inspired Talks, there's this cryptic statement, the only thing that we can do is polish the mirror. In the Himalayas, monks often greet each other by this uh, statement, um, well, Swami, is the mirror clear? Is the mirror clear today? Mahatma ji, darpan saaf hai? Oh monk, is the mirror clear today? What he means is, is the mind limpid and lucid and, and clarity? Clarity about what? About the Vedantic truth. And that's possible only when the dust of desire is cleansed. And then he says, there's a deeper, con a worse condition. It's like the embryo in the mother's womb encased by the placenta. And in that case, one just has to wait for the baby to be born. It takes time. What it means is, in such cases, experience is necessary. Lifetime's experience. So such people, it will not help if you give them Vedanta lectures. They won't come to the lecture anyway. <laughs> they, think it's, they think it's a waste of time. Why go and listen to a dusty old philosophy? What good it is? There's so much fun in, in the world outside. Go and have a good time. So for them, it will take time. Sri Ramakrishna, he would pick his disciples. He was very choosy, very picky. He would pick his disciples very carefully. But Vivekananda had a large heart. So when he saw anybody suffering, who had even the slightest inclination for spirituality, religion, he would drag the person to Ramakrishna. He knew Ramakrishna had the power to uplift that person's mind. So he would tell Sri Ramakrishna, do something for him. He would plead. And he was Sri Ramakrishna's favorite disciple and Ramakrishna did not have the heart to refuse him. But Ramakrishna would say, you know, it's not his time. You can't be impatient about these things. Let, let him experience life. Let him go through life. In one or two cases, because of Vivekananda's pleading, Ramakrishna actually gave a genuine spiritual experience to that person, but then added <coughs> that that's all for this lifetime. It will haunt him in lives to come, and he will turn to the spiritual life. So something will haunt him in future. He may, he may forget it, what, what has happened to him. But it will haunt him. So that's the only thing that Ramakrishna would do for that person. Let him take his time. So he says, there's a condition where the layer of desire is so thick, like a skin. It takes time to grow out of it. One of the monks was joking. That we are probably like Vivekananda's friends, you know, whom he would... Ramakrishna, would, Ramakrishna knew a few words of English. So one of them was friend. He would say, parent. <laughs> so when Vivekananda would drag one of these cases from off the street and bring him to Ramakrishna and say, do something for him. And Ramakrishna would sort of roll his eyes and say, one of Narendra's parents, you know. <laughs> so we are like that mostly. We have, some monk was joking. We are like Narendra's parents whom he has dragged before Ramakrishna. Do something for these people. <laughs> so. And then Krishna goes on. Avritam jnana metena jnani no nitya vairina kama rupena kaunteya dushpurena nalena cha The Vedantic teaching which is given, which you study, which you listen, what happens is this desire, this layer of tendencies from our past lives or this life, it covers this knowledge. It does not allow this knowledge to be effective. So, avritam, avritam means covered. Desire covers this knowledge. And then Krishna says, this, these tendencies in our mind, these stored up tendencies, these are the eternal, these are the constant enemy of spiritual seekers. He uses his language carefully. He says it's a constant enemy for us, for spiritual seekers. Not a constant enemy for others, for those who are at this level. Desire is, is in fact what gives them happiness. What gives happiness for the majority of, of humanity? 
I want something, I struggle to get it, I get it, and I'm happy. Right? In uh, When Krishna talks about giving up desires, one of the commentators writes, this is madness. If you give up desires, if you give up desires for this and that, and you do not struggle to fulfill your desires, how will you be happy? So look at the concept of happiness involved there. I want something, I struggle to get it, and then I do get it, I enjoy it, and that's happiness. And then I want something more, and I struggle for that, and try to get it, and that's happiness. If you give up desires, how will you be happy? So that's the question there. So he says, for ordinary people, desire is not a constant enemy. It's usually the source of happiness. I pursue that and I get some happiness and that's it. It becomes an enemy because in, in consequence, in, in accumulation, in, in culmination, it's desire which has led, led me to this unhappiness in general. So people do understand that desire is a cause of unhappiness, but not usually. Uh, usually desire is taken as a part of life in which we must pursue and fulfill. But for a, for a spiritual seeker, all desires except desire for enlightenment, all other desires are the enemy, which, which are the stumbling block, which divert us away from spiritual seeking. Here as an aside, somebody may ask, so isn't desire for God also a desire? So I've got desires for the world and you've got desires for God, so we've both got desires, that's it. Sri Ramakrishna says, no, desire for God cannot be counted among desires because it destroys all other desires. He gives a homely example. He says, um, sugar candy? Mishri? Yes. He says, uh, that cannot be considered a sweet because sweets produce acidity, acid reflux. And this thing destroys acid. Though they both taste sweet. But this one destroys acidity. If you've got acidity, you take that and destroy the acidity. In the same way, Desires for the world ultimately le lead to unhappiness. Desire for God helps you to overcome that unhappiness. So it cannot be considered among worldly desires. Now, how do we get out of this situation? Um, Arjuna's question. What is it that prevents me? And the answer was desire and anger, born of desire. Now, how do I get out of it? What is the technique? Here is where we will relate what we learned yesterday. Krishna now says, where does desire lie? What is the hiding place? What is the secret location where desire resides? That's what you must watch and attack. Indriyani mano buddhi asya dheshthana mujyate etair vimohayat tiesha jnanam abritya dehinam Three places you must look at. Desire acts at three levels. At the level of the sensory system. Indriya means senses. At the level of the sensory system. At the level of the mind. And at the level of the intellect. At the level of the intellect, the mind and the sensory system. If you ask, isn't the mind and intellect the same thing? They are basically the same thing, but two different functions. The mind here includes the emotions, thoughts, memories, all of that. Intellect is understanding and knowledge and clarity. So... At each of these levels, desire operates. Working through that, it traps the spiritual seeker, does not allow us to progress. Then what must we do? We must, first of all, control it at the outset, at the level of the senses. Look at Krishna's uh, teaching, the next verse, 41. Tasma tvam indriyanyado niyamya bharatarshava Papmanam prajahi yenam jnana vijnana nashanam First of all, O Arjuna, look to the senses, the sensory system. What we are seeing, what we are tasting, what we are hearing, what we smell, what we touch. The inputs from the world to the five gates of, this, of the psyche, the five senses. I was saying yesterday how if you eat just about anything, in this country now we are so conscious about what we eat. If somebody goes out into the garbage bin there and roots around there and picks up something, some heart rotten thing and stuffs it into his mouth, he will be immediately sick. He will get sick immediately. But that's what we are doing through the five, five doors of the senses. Whatever the world puts before us, any kind of trash that we drag in through the eyes. 
whether it's from t- TV or internet or just gossip with people, you know, we have an especially keen ear for what people are saying about us. Mostly it will be unkind. So <laughs> why do you want to listen to that? When you drag it into the mind, when you pull in all these things, what people are saying, what you are seeing on in the, mostly in the media or in the internet, or, and you pull it into the eyes, and all of it is dumped into the mind. No wonder the mind is sick. No wonder the mind is exhausted. No wonder the mind is clogged with this. So the first thing would be uh, at the level, a discipline at the level of the senses. There is a saying that, what a tragedy of my life. A spiritual seeker says this, the tragedy of my life is, I have become the servant of my servants. The mind is my servant, and the sense organs are the servants of the mind. But I have become the serv- servant of the sense organs. The eye wants to see this, I run and w- work hard to get a um, you know, first ticket for that movie so that I can go and see it, because eyes want to see that. Ears want to hear that, so I work hard to, 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 hear, to supply things for the ears. The tongue wants to taste this, and you have entire streets, the restaurant street, the, the street, the hotel street, it's food. It's necessary for maintaining this body. That's all it is. But an enormous industry to pander to the sense of taste. I remember once I was very sick, many years ago, about, about 20 years ago. And I was in the hospital. And I was so sick that I couldn't eat anything for two weeks, so they had me on an IV. And if you gave me something, I would have thrown it up. But the interesting thing was, when I slept at night, I dreamt about all the foods that I, I liked as a kid. If you had actually woken me up and presented me with all those foods, I wouldn't have been able to eat it because the physical system is not capable of eating and taking that food. But you know what happens? It's not just the body which wants that. The mind and the sense organs want taste. That's not in the best interest of the body. It's just the sense organ is designed that way, it wants particular tastes. And there are certain evolutionary reasons behind it, why our sense organs evolve that way. But it's like that. So it's not helpful. It's damaging for the physical system, but the sense organ wants to enjoy that. Even when the body cannot eat, it projects those desires in the form of dreams. So taste, hearing, smell, touch, and especially seeing sense organs drag in all kinds of trash from the world and dump it in the mind. No wonder we cannot make spiritual progress. So that's the first thing. Guard the gates of the subtle body, the five gates of the subtle body. Indriyani Adho, first control that. Then we go to the... So controlling that means drawing a limit around yourself. These are my standards. This is what I consider to be decent. This is what I consider to be non indecent, immoral. I will not step outside. Just because it is there, do I have to enjoy it? Just because it is available, do I have to see it? Just because it's there, do I have to taste it? No. It's a, it's a little kid, a, a toddler who will behave like that. What is in front, he'll just take and put it in the mouth. Why should we behave like that? So exercise that control. I remember once in the, in the monastery when I joined as a young monk, we had a great teacher, um, I mean, I can tell the name, so, Swami Suhitanandaji, who is now the Vice President of the Order. He was our, uh, the Swami in charge, and we were young novices. Many of us, there were about 10 or 12, one of the older monks quipped that the road has to be broadened now, because when the Swami walks, all these 10, 12 young uh, monks, they walk with him, and <laughs> so you need a, a wider road. So every day we would walk with him at night and he would teach us. Wonderful. I mean, those are the, I would consider them the foundation of my monastic life. Wonderful years. I remember one day when we had finished the walk and we were going back to the monks' quarters and it was night and all these young people, we were all in white. The novices were white and the Swami was with us and was walking past a flowering tree with a creeper. It's fragrant flowers. And as I walked past, I smelt it. And the Swami is so alert, he immediately whipped around and looked at me. 
just because it is there, do you have to enjoy it? Do you have to smell it? That is not the sign of a yogi. That alertness. You might think, what's wrong in smelling a flower? Even if you do, do it in an alert way. Don't let the... This, it's a sense of smell which pulled you. You are not alert at that time. I want to enjoy it, so go there. I want to taste this, so eat that. I want to see that, so see that. No. Have you consciously decided to do it? Have you made a choice to do it? Then it's not so bad. But you have not made a choice. Your, your senses did not consult you. They just made you do it. They just dragged you there and made you do it. So that's what he's objecting to. That's not the sign of a yogi. Are you mindful? You're not mindful. Your senses are pulling you here and there. How can you be a yogi? How can the Vedantic teaching about the isness, the, the, the silent witness beyond the body and mind, how can you stabilize yourself in that if the mind keeps getting dragged out here and there by the five senses? Swami Turiyananda, in direct co contrast to this, Swami Turiyananda was once in Belurmat, in the main monastery. Now in summer in Belurmat, it gets very hot. I, I remember this time when I flew out of Manhattan, somebody asked, uh, so Swami, what are you going to do to beat the heat? I said, to beat the heat, I'm going to California, to San Diego, and then to Calcutta. And he said, yeah, that's the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hot there in, in, uh, in summer. And so there's a beautiful drink, a, a lovely cooling drink made of curd, what you might call a kind of lassi with a lot of, uh, ingredients put into it, which is offered to the deity, Sri Ramakrishna, in the main temple in Belurmat in summer. Every day it's offered. And after being offered, it becomes prasad, the offered food, the sac um, sacramental food. And every day, one monk gets it. So, <laughs> next day somebody else will get it, next day somebody else will get it. I've got it too, and I would look, look forward to it. It was really wonderful, you know, something uh, in that heat especially. And it's an old tradition. When Turiyanandaji was there, it was his turn. So the brahmachari came with the glass, with that you know, thick white drink, and very nice, and gave it to him. He took one sip and he returned it. He said, take it away. And the young monk was flustered. He said, why Swami, is it not good? And Swami said, it is good, that's why. <laughs> It is good, that's why. <laughs> Look at the iron control he exercises uh, over, over the, the gates of the subtle body, the senses, the tongue and the... Yes. There was once a feast in Belurmat, in Swami Shivan in this time. These funny stories are there. And a good food. And a monk from Advaita Ashram, which is in Calcutta, he heard about it. It is a... The grape wine among the monks is called the lotus wine. So <laughs> he had this a nice, it's going to be nice food in Belurmat today. So he landed up in Belurmat. And lo and behold, Mahapurush Maharaj, Swami Shivananda, who was the president of the order, looked at him. Why are you here today? He fumbled, he couldn't lie. So he fumbled and fumbled and fumbled and hemmed and hawed. And Mahapurush Maharaj looked at him and he said, I see. Go back to your ashram immediately. <laughs> and the poor person had to go back without taking the food. I remember another incident from the Himalayas where these monks, um, there was a great teacher. I went to his, uh, he has passed away. I went to the cottage where he lived. And this Vedantic teacher, his name is Tapovan Swami. He was the teacher. You know, what is the Chinmay mission, Swami Chinmayananda? He, he was Chinmayananda, his teacher. But he lived all his, the rest of his life in the Himalayas till the end. So there's a little cottage where he lived. Now there's a reminiscence about him. The groups of people would come, the monks would come to learn Vedanta from him, sit around him. He was very austere. You have to be, first of all, you have to be a monk, otherwise he will not teach. Then you have to get your own accommodations. He will not accommodate you in, in his hut. It's difficult to get accommodations there. You have to find your own hut or cave. And I really mean that even today you have to find your own cave. <laughs> <laughs> the monks do live there even now. And uh, you have to beg for your food. And then you get two classes a day and that's it. No Q&A. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll have our Q&A, but no Q&A. <laughs> One of the monks after the class waited for uh, 
uh, the class to be over and he yeah. went to Tapu and Swami and asked a question. And the Swami said, looked at him coldly and said, go back to your hut and contemplate. That's his only answer. Manan ki ji, Brahmachari Maharaj. Manan ki ji. Go, go, and, go and think about it. No answers. Only the teaching. Now one day the monks were gathered around for the teaching and a delivery man came up with a basket of fruits and sweets. Some devotee had sent it for the Swami in the Himalaya. And you can imagine all those starving monks who have been used to the rough food of the, of the mountains. They see all this nice food from the cities and they, ah, oh, so today we're going to have it. Surely he can't eat it all himself. So he's going to share it with us. And the Swami said, okay, take it inside the hut, put it there. And he went on with the class as if nothing has happened. I said, oh, okay, maybe tomorrow. And the next day, the class started. He didn't even mention the food inside the hut. By the second day, the uh, students were grumbling and gossiping about it. The Swami, is he eating it all himself? <laughs> Won't he give anything, to, uh, anything of it to us? In the evening class, as the class convened, and there was some disgruntlement about, <laughs> about the food going on in their minds, the teacher said to one of the young monks, go inside, get that basket. And everybody thought, ah, sort of rolling up their sleeves. <laughs> and they brought out the basket. It had not been opened. He hadn't touched any of it. And then the Swami said, go to the Ganges and throw it into the Ganges. <laughs> and he took it and threw it into the Ganges. And the Swami went on with the class, having taught a great lesson in how the mind behaves. The sense organs, how they... You are here to learn about the self, that you are Brahman, infinite existence, consciousness. And you are worried about a couple of mangoes? <laughs> that's, the, that's the sense organs. So control that first, then the mind comes under control. The mind comes under control in meditation and prayer only when first the outer circle, the senses are controlled. Then controlling the mind, focusing the mind on God is much easier. Then what do you do? Then we come to the real point of this teaching. 42nd verse. Indriyani paranyahu indriyebhya param manaha manasastu para buddhi yo buddhe paratastu sa He says, O oh Arjuna, now watch yourself. The indriyas, the sense organs, Sensory system is powerful, excellent. Para means excellent, powerful. But look inside. Subtler than the senses, inner to the senses, and more powerful than the senses. Sanskrit words are sukshma, pratyak, uh, para. Para means more powerful. So more powerful than the senses, inner to the senses, subtler than the senses is the mind. The mind transcends the senses because clearly the mind is subtler than the senses. You can, you can just look into yourself and see the five sense organs and the mind is subtler than that. And the mind is inner to the senses. The senses are the outer gates. Inside is the mind. Just look, it's true. And the mind is the one which controls the senses. Here is a secret of spiritual practice. If the mind is that which controls the senses, shouldn't you start off by controlling the mind? If the mind is controlled, then the senses are automatically controlled. True, in principle, in practice it doesn't work. In practice you have to start with the gross, it, the gross, the outer. So to start with the senses, then only the mind comes under control. Alright, then, manasastu paravadhi, inner to the mind, subtler than the mind, more powerful than the mind, is the intellect. Inner to the mind, subtler than the mind, more powerful than the mind is the intellect. Intellect is a function which dwells in the mind itself. It's subtle. It's, the fun it's a function of clarity and knowledge and conviction. When you say, I am say, I am Swami Sarva Priyananda, it's the intellect which is convinced of this. It's that intellect which must be convinced, I am Satchidananda, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. It is that intellect which must be convinced. All right, so the intellect is subtler than the mind, inner to the mind, more powerful than the mind, controller of the mind. Again, shouldn't we be controlling the intellect in that case? Control the intellect, educate the intellect. Intellect can control the mind, but we know it's not true. We may read all the books in the world, but we still complain our minds are not in control. 
Do you remember the mahut and elephant example I gave yesterday? Yes. yes. The intellect understands books, it understands Vedanta talks, it understands Gita and Upanishads. The mind has a mess of desires and tendencies rooted in it. So, first of all, the mind has to be calmed. Again, the outer has to be calmed before the inner can take charge. Plato said famously, to know what is good is to be good. To know what is good is to be good. So if you educate a person in morals and virtues, the person should be virtuous and, and moral. But we know that it's not true. We know what is good. That's what Duryodhana was saying. I know what's good. But what's the problem? I don't feel like doing it. I know what's wrong. I can't stop myself from doing it. So the inter what happens is the intellect is educated in what is good, but the mind does not, the, is, is out of control. So the intellect cannot execute. The mahut cannot control the elephant. The elephant doesn't want to listen to the mahut. The mind and the sensory system do not respond to the knowledge of the intellect. It's only when you control the ex external, the sensory system, then control the mind, then the knowledge in the intellect will, will be, the intellect will be able to execute that knowledge. Yo buddhe parastastusa, beyond the intellect, that which is beyond the intellect is the Atman, is the real self. Think about it. If there are no thoughts, no ideas, no knowledge, no memory, what are you? You are still that, that presence, that existence, that awareness, that witness within, which shines upon the intellect, which shines upon the mind, which shines upon the sensory system, that unchanging existence consciousness bliss. Right now you are that. What has happened is we have forgotten that and we identify ourselves with the intellect, mind, sensory system and think, I am this individual. What we have to do is we have to see that I am not the sensory system, I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am the existence consciousness beyond the intellect. The intellect, the mind and the sensory system are objects and I am the pure subject. This is what we have to understand. Established in that, we can now use the intellect, mind and sensory system for spiritual practice. I have to repeat that, that's the conclusion. That Atman which we understood yesterday as pure existence within ourselves, established in that, the intellect convinced that I am not the intellect itself, I am the Atman beyond the intellect. The I in the mind should refer to that which is beyond the mind. The I should not refer to the mind-body system. The identity now is with the mind-body system. The identity has to be shifted to the witness of the mind-body system, the pure existence which is beyond the mind-body system. Established in that, here is the solution which Arjuna is being, uh, is being given by Krishna. Established in that, you can actually bring the mind and the senses under control. He says in next, Evam buddhe param buddhva sangstabhyatmanam atmana jahi shatrum mahabaho kamarupam durasadam he says, O oh Arjuna, O oh mighty warrior, having understood, getting clarity that you are not the mind-body system, you're not the intellect even, you're not even the mind, you're not even the senses. Beyond all of this, that pure existence bliss is what you are. Established in that, bring the sensory system and the mind and the intellect under control. Using the sensory system, mind and intellect, using them. Use the intellect to bring the mind under control. Use the mind and intellect to bring the senses under control. And thus you will be able to pursue spiritual path. That which is, literally the, trans the translation is, that which is beyond the intellect, know yourself to be that. Knowing yourself to be that, now use the intellect, the knowledge in the intellect, to bring the mind in line. Use the mind to bring the sense organs in line and then you will be able to proceed in spiritual practice. It's a subtle teaching, but a very powerful teaching. I'll end with an, something that I myself heard. One of the Swamis whom I know, and we know him to be a very advanced spiritual soul, a very advanced spiritual practitioner. Once he was telling me how he overcame lust. And 
he he described it and i was this this is what was in my mind i listened to him and i said swami unless you have had the realization that you are not the mind body system you are the atman the witness beyond the mind body system you could not have done this because what is the nature of lust or desire any kind of desire the nature of desire is i want and what is the nature of trying to control i do not want if the desire is there i want and and you are trying to say i do not want what will happen is you are trying to pull it back and the desire is trying to go forward you have a conflict that's the nature of conflict where i who am i am the mind and body and the senses and the mind and the intellect and what 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 do you want i want these things what else do you want i i don't want to want these things i want to control them desire is right there so the mind and the intellect and the senses say i want and you're trying to do spiritual practice with that the enemy is in the house you're trying to do spiritual practice with that and in bengali they say shorshit bhutach so anyway i won't, I won't translate that <laughs> folklore they use some kind of grains to drive away ghosts person possessed possessed by a ghost so some kind of technique is use some grains and all they are sprinkled and all. but if the the ghost is in the grains themselves then you can't drive it at all <laughs> so it's only when you see that the mind the senses and the intellect are the vehicle it's not you you are separate from them then you can bring them under control that clarity must come i am not these things they are the instrumentation the equipment which belong to me and they will do what is good for me i am not there to do what's good for them or what they think is pleasant when that position you take then things fall into line and then spiritual practice meditation prayer unselfish action uh, devotion to god and vedanta vichara all of them become easy so i ask that swami you must have had that enlightening experience that i am not the body of the mind otherwise you cannot do this you will feel torn apart what you just said and the swami smiled and admitted it to me he said yes long ago many many years ago that clarity came that clearly i saw that i am not the body and mind all right we'll stop here and take some questions the power of choice the presentation was divided into two parts one was this thing what do we want in life make a choice clearly that we want enlightenment the second thing was that once once you go on the in path of enlightenment seeking enlightenment there will be obstacles that was arjuna's question and krishna's answer we saw that realizing yourself basing yourself on the clarity that you are the atman bring the sensory system mind and intellect under control yes question oh you have a, you have a question there Put it close to you. Put it close to your mouth. Oh. Hello. Just go ahead. Just speak loud. That's all. Oh, okay. I. Uh, I was uh, initiated at home when I was eleven or twelve years. Hold it like this. Yes. Eleven or twelve years. It's not on. It's on. It's on. It's on. Yeah. I was initiated. Yes. Eleven and twelve years. You know, in Indian system, then my grandfather told me. six enemies you have which is come from no more moment matsarj yes which you are saying the pride greed anger and all those things how to control them and we had a rule that you were able to play uh, in the afternoon you had to do some prayer to control that and even to this day i find what is said is so hard so hard to control all those enemies that we have but uh, even though you can uh, split your mind it's not so easy so uh, is there any other way that that you can you can give yourself power to control that that's my question right notice what you said it's very hard Now the question is, why is it hard? That's what Arjuna is asking. That's where Duryodhana gave up. It's too hard. 
Why is it hard? And you know what is, Arjun, what is Krishna's answer? It's hard because you identify yourself with the body-mind. The body-mind, where those things reside. I am that body. See, I am that body. The tongue, I am the tongue. I am the, I am the eyes, I am the ears. The tongue wants to taste nice things. So what do I say? I want to taste nice things, sweet things. The eyes want to see such and such thing, which might be unhelpful for my spiritual practice. But since I am this system, I say I want to see it. And when I try to sp practice spiritual practices, I say I want it. At the same time, I say I don't want it. I'm trying to control it. And that's why it becomes hard. Mm -hmm. What was Krishna's solution? He says, first get a clarity about this fact <coughs> that you are not this sense, body, mind, sense system. How do you do that? Notice it. Notice. Is it difficult to notice the senses? That I have eyes and I see through the eyes. Is it difficult to notice? No, it's a fact. Pay attention. Here are the senses. They have their individual tastes. You know, something is pleasant for the eyes, something is unpleasant. Something is pleasant for the tongue, something is unpleasant. Deeper than the eyes is what? What was mentioned here? The mind. Inner to the eyes. Subtler than the eyes and more powerful than the mind, uh, eyes or the sense system is the mind. The mind also has its own the desires that are embedded there. Yeah. But I am not the mind also. And then subtler than the mind, inner to the mind, more powerful than the mind is the intellect. I am not the intellect also. He says beyond the intellect. If I am not these, then what happens is, follow this carefully. The senses, the mind and the intellect and their tendencies, the desires and the, whatever you say, what, what resides in them, they all become objects for me, like this thing, you know? like this object before me. It becomes an object in, in my consciousness. Then it becomes easier to control because I am no longer those things. If I am that, then every desire in that system is my desire. Then how can I control it? It becomes an endless strife. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes. Krishna, Krishna is asking, asking you to step back from that system. You are really not that sense, mind, intellect system. But you have become identified with it. You dissociate yourself in your understanding, in the intellect itself. The understanding comes in the intellect itself. Then it becomes easier. Can I position myself between I want and don't want neither of them? The one inside. Suppose you want something. Well, I don't want, but I am not. No, listen, listen, what, listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. Um, when you say, I want something, uh, whether the tongue wants it or the eyes want to see something or whatever it is, are you aware that you want it? You have to say yes or no. Yeah. You're aware. That one which is aware, of the mind and its desire. Where is the desire? Is the desire in the consciousness or the desire is in the mind? Desire is in the mind. You don't seem to be sure. You don't seem to be sure. This has to be done very subtly. Watch this carefully. A desire. Say, let's take a simple desire. I want to eat a cookie. Simple desire. Where is the desire? It certainly functions through the sense, the, the, the yeah. sense of taste. And the desire is also in the mind, right? Mm -hmm. And it's in the intellect. What did Krishna say? It, follow this carefully. Mm -hmm. Krishna said, the, the, the location of desire, where desire functions is on the sensory level, at the mental level, at the intellectual level. What's at the sensory level? A particular taste. I want this. What's at the mental level? Past impressions. Cookies are nice. I want to eat cookies. What's at the intellectual level? That the conviction that this is a good thing to have and it will give me pleasure. A, some kind of feeling is that it gives pleasure. It has given pleasure in the past. If I eat it, it will give pleasure. That kind of understanding is there. That kind of desire is there. Understanding in the intellect, desire in the, uh, in the mind and certain tendencies of the, ten, of the senses. You see where each thing is. Place it carefully. It requires careful thought and observation. Now, are you aware of these tendencies of the, of the senses, the desire in the mind and this understanding in their intellect? 
Are you aware of this? You have to say yes and I will not go forward otherwise. If I get a cookie, I will eat it. If I don't, it's fine with me. If I get a cookie, I'll eat it. If I don't, it's fine with me. You can go ahead like that. Stumble and get hurt and we will never get anywhere in life. Vedanta requires thinking. If you say in a Vedanta class, if I get a cookie, I'll eat. If I don't get it, it's fine with me. Where is the Vedanta in this? Where is the solution to your problem in this? You just said you have a problem. The six enemies, you say, mother, master, you know, pride and delusion and greed and anger. These are the six enemies your father told you. You have to control them. You just said, and then you said it's a problem. Difficult to control them. They have a problem. Now Vedanta is giving you a way of solving that problem. The way requires thinking. Way requires understanding. What are the steps of understanding? You must walk with me. If you just stick to... If I have a cookie, I'll eat it. If I don't have a cookie, I won't eat it. There's no, there's no progress there. Take a little further step. The step is this. Identify where is the problem. The senses have what? Tendencies. The mind has what? Certain desires. The intellect has what? A wrong understanding that this cookie will make me happy. It has made me happy or it will make me happy now. Do you have, you have understood these things? Is it clear? At this stage, is it clear? Some clarity dawning? Now, follow this the next step very carefully. The awareness in which this understanding is coming, that awareness, does it have those tendencies, desires or wrong, understand, wrong understanding? No. That awareness is free of this. Proof. When you have a desire for cookies, you are aware of the desire for cookies. You don't have a desire for cookies all day long. When you don't have a desire for cookies, the awareness is still there, no desire. So the awareness is there, awareness by mean, at that I mean consciousness. You the consciousness, you the awareness are there when the desire is there. You the awareness or consciousness, you are there when the desire is not there. Proving thereby you the awareness are free of that, con that desire. It arises in your light, it dis disappears in your light. Now, what Krishna says, answer the question, who are you? Are you the senses? Are you the mind? Are you the intellect? Or are you this awareness? You will say, I am that awareness. The senses and the mind and the intellect are instruments which I use. Having stepped back into that awareness, it becomes much easier to deal with the intellect, mind and senses. Being in the middle of that, I want and I don't want, you're in the mind. It becomes difficult. He says, this is much easier. This is the methodical way to go about it. If I am the awareness, does awareness or consciousness need a cookie? If you see a tongue, does the tongue need a cookie? You might say, yeah, the tongue needs a cookie. The tongue, tongue wants the cookie. <laughs> but does consciousness, pure consciousness need a cookie? No, it does not. If I am pure consciousness, as pure consciousness, I couldn't, I would be least bothered whether I have a cookie or not. Right? Okay. So, this is the clue. But I will uh, go on to one or two more questions before we end. Uh, over here. Over here, yes. Uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, we, we talked about, um, The mind is uh, impure and to control the mind, the first step is the doing meditation. Uh, but it looks like uh, today, first we have to come to the understanding that we are not, we should, we should not be tied with the body, but with the, with, with the uh, sense, uh, with the consciousness. And that looks like uh, first we have to come to the understand come to that understanding first and then control the senses? Alright, I, I think I get the ten, uh, trend of your question. Control the senses first. Start with the gross and the outermost. That gives you some freedom to control the mind. And then the, that gives you some freedom to correct the error in the intellect. All of this becomes easier 
in a Vedantic conviction, a Vedantic understanding that I am neither the intellect nor the mind nor the senses. That is there. Based upon that, now you can first control the senses, then control the mind, then bring your, the, the, the correct the error in the intellect. Yeah. If you are saying about the, about the sequence of practice, remember I pointed out, knowledge is very difficult if the mind is not concentrated. Concentration of mind is very difficult if the, if the desires have not been purified. So first of all, karma yoga helps in purifying desires. Meditation helps in concentrating the purified mind. And then the Vedanta Vichara gives result as the clarity that I am not the body mind. Practically what do I have to do? So do I, do I have to do 20 years of karma yoga first and then 10 years of meditation and then a few, few Vedanta retreats? No, you have to do all of them. But see where the shoe pinches. And that's where you must focus. Question. Microphone. Oh, oh, that gentleman. Okay. Yes, I'll come to you. Micro microphone. Hold it near you. This is regarding your lecture yesterday about isness. Yes. There is a man and woman and building and all this. Yes. And this is isness in a different way. And then we use the Vedantic teaching of Nam and Rupa. Yes. Names and forms. So I went home and studied a little bit. Ashtavakra, you have gone. You have gone to the highest. <laughs> there is a question raised. Yes. Just like Nama and Rupa, names and form is very important in Vedanta. My teacher, I'm from Chicago. He said, if you don't understand names and form, Nama and Rupa, you cannot understand Vedanta. It's so fundamental. So Ashtavakra Sanita says there is another fundamental principle of Vedanta. Ghata Akash, Maha Akash, chapter one, verse twenty. So, would you, would you tell us, Nam and Rupa, you told us, would you tell us more about Ghatakash and Mahakash? Same thing. All right. How, how do you use it? Nam and Rupa, you All right. You used uh, the terms Ghatakash and Mahakash. It's an example. Ghata means pot. Pot space. Ghatakasha means pot space. And Mahakasha means the universal, the space all around. Yeah. Now what the example, what they are doing there is, they are saying that space is actually indivisible. Space is one and indivisible, just see around you. But what we do is, we construct barriers, we construct structures and we say inside the house and outside the house. The, ha the space of the house, here is the space of this lecture room, here is the space of the overflow room. It's actually one space. It's because of the walls that it looks different. Exactly like that, a pot, if you keep a pot, there's space inside the pot and there's space outside the pot. This very language, the space inside the pot and space outside the pot, is, it's an illusion created by the existence of the pot. Actually, space is not broken up by the existence of the pot. The understanding would be like this. Suppose you take a pot, empty pot, there's space inside it. If you carry it from one place to another, the pot has moved. Now, do you think the space in the pot has moved also? <laughs> if you take... Oh, there's the answer. I don't know. <laughs> All right, let me make it easier. Let, let me make it easier. L listen, listen carefully. There's a pot with water in it. If you move the pot, is the water moving along with the pot? Now people, even now some are not very clear. <laughs> Maybe ocean mark inside the ocean. Yeah. No, no, let, let's, let's watch this. Yeah. You move the, move the pot with, with water in it. Is the water moving with the pot or not? You'll make an yeah. awful mess if you don't. Yeah. If the water doesn't move with it, if you've got the water in the pot and move the pot and the water stays there, you'll make a mess. <laughs> okay. Now, so the water moves when you move the pot, clearly. Mm -hmm. But if it's an empty pot, by the same logic, does the space in the pot move when you move the pot? I think so. The air, the air, the air, air moves, moves. But, but does the space move? I think that's the confusion. Yeah. No, it's the air moves, certainly. If you have, a, if you have uh, blocked the, uh, the uh, mouth of the pot, and then you move it, the air inside moves. It, the air is also a kind of fluid. But does the space move along with the pot? No. no. It's rather that the pot moves through space. So really speaking, follow this, the pot does not delimit or cut off space. It just seems like that. It's like there is space and this pot has occupied, has cut off this much space. 
It just looks like that. Actually, part does not delimit space, does not demarcate space. Not only the part, our houses also. Mm -hmm. We think this is inside my house and that's the space outside my house. This space is for this, that space. It's an entire delusion created by the presence of these structures. Nothing really happens to space. None of these objects can affect space. This is an example. What's it meant to show? Consciousness, pure consciousness, pure existence is one and unbroken. You feel that this object, let's take existence, this object has its own existence, this object has its own existence. No. What they're trying to show is existence in this place is, has taken the name and form of a pen. Existence in this place has taken the na name and form of a book. It's not that there is something called a book which has existence. No. Like the example of wave and uh, ocean. In the ocean, in the waves, would you say that the wave has water in it or water it appears as a wave? Which is a more logical way of speaking. What does it look like? It looks like the, this wave has a lot of water. That wave has less, less water. But that's not true. Even before the wave came, the water was there. When the wave is there, the water is there. When the wave disappears, the water will still be there. The wave is nothing but a name and form of the same water. It's a kind of activity in the same water. It's the water which itself which appears as the wave. Similarly, we are saying it is existence itself, pure existence, which appears as this book with name and form book. It is pure existence which appears as the pen with name and form pen. That is the difference between so part space and the total cosmic space, it's one and the same. The part seems to demarcate, cut off that space. It's, it's an illusion. That's what the uh, example is talking about. There's a question so there. Last question. Last question. Okay. In your decision-making lectures, you talk about stairs and prayers. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is not used in, uh, by Sri Krishna. And Take microphone. That is not used by Sri Krishna in this. True. Context. Thank you for reminding me. Look at this. Shreyas and prayers in the Upanishads, it comes. That all the time for a spiritual seeker, to all human beings, but for a spiritual seeker, person who has a spiritual goal, that which is pleasant and that which is helpful, they come. And often they are not the same thing. What helps you along in spiritual life towards enlightenment is present before you. And what is pleasant and nice is also present before you. You have to make a choice continuously. No. Do you see what I mean? Right now, what will I do? What will I say? What will I think? There's a pleasant activity to do. It's nice to lay, lay down in the bed and go to sleep. That's the pleasant. But what's good, what's beneficial if I'm a spiritual seeker? It might be to sit and meditate. <laughs> Both options are open to me right now. What do I have to say in a particular situation? Somebody is being annoying and I want to give a sharp retort to that person. That's the pleasant, easy option. What's the spiritual option? To retain control over my uh, organ of speech. And to say what is true, what is beneficial, or to say nothing at all if the situation demands it. That control is good for my spiritual life. Lashing out is pleasant for, for the ego. It's present before me. The two options are present before me. What more so at the level of thought? Right now, what thought do I entertain? The mind has this capacity of entertaining only one thought at a time. Most of us function on default mode. Whatever comes to the mind, it comes to the mind. The pleasant mode, cruising along, thinking about this and that. Or thinking about pleasurable things. Or thinking about gossip, or thinking about anything that is non-spiritual and yet pleasant. I have a tendency to entertain those thoughts. But what's the spiritual thing to do? To dwell on Vedantic thoughts. Or if a person has a mantra or some kind of spiritual practice, then is there any thought that we think throughout the day which is more valuable than the mantra? No. Which is more valuable than a spiritual thought? No. If you've got some work to do, do it and finish it. Most of the other time is, is just the mind is churning away. So you have the power of choice. Very good that you pointed out. At these three levels, what should I think? What should I say? What should I do? You have the power of choice. Choice between what is pleasant and easy and habitual and what is helpful in spiritual life. Every action, the Upanishad says, it, nature presents you with a choice. 
normally we do not exercise the power of choice. We cruise along in default mode. We just go on doing it. And that's why you never get anywhere in spiritual life. But if we exercise the power of choice, when? All the time. When do we have the power of choice? All the time. It's an interesting thing, you know. People think we have the power of choice only on the 1st of January, our New Year's resolutions. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a trick of the mind. Oh, I decided to get up early in the morning and do yoga, but I failed. I know, I don't have willpower. When did you decide? The 1st of January. And then? And that's it. Why not decide once again? Why not decide every day anew? Exactly. You can use the power. The power of choice is unlimited 24 hours, every minute, every second is present to you. It's fresh and present to you. Use that power of choice. Forget what, I tried it one year ago, did not work. Forget it. <laughs> Try it now. Doesn't work. Again take a decision. Doesn't work. Again take a decision. Because the power is avail it's free and available to you all the time. The power of choice is available to us 24 hours a day. Every time. About what to do what to say and what to think. Deal with it at the power of thought, most powerful. It will transform your life within a matter of hours or days. The power of choice is available. The way the mind works, the way the mind tricks us is like this. Mind says that, okay, make a, um, we make a choice, I have to get up early and do yoga or something or meditation. And then I fail. And the mind says, look, it's meant only for the Swamis. I told you, you can't do it. It's not for you. You're no good. What it conveniently hides from you, the mind hides from you, that you have the power of making the choice, the same choice all over again at that point. Continuously exercise the power of choice. This is called, as you said, Shreyas and Prayas. Shreyas means that which is good for us. Prayas means that which is pleasant for us. If the two are one and the same, it would be nice. <laughs> but often it is not. So, Shreyash is moksha. In Upanishad, the only thing that is ultimately good for us is spirituality. The rest is all pleasant. Prayers. The realm of the pleasant. And we get trapped in that because we do not exercise the power of choice. We get trapped in this. The default mode is to seek the pleasant. Our body-mind systems are designed to seek the pleasant, the easier, the nicer uh, way. And so we, we flow down into this, into, um, into dharma, artha, kama. Nothing wrong with dharma. Little bit maybe wrong with artha and a lot wrong with kama, but we tend to flow downwards. The power of choice makes us stick to this. Yes, thank you for telling me. All right, let's conclude now. Thank you very much. So, um, so we'll, we'll meet back up at uh, 12, we'll try 12.05, uh, actually 12.10, let's make it 12.10, so half an hour. And we have, again, if you, it's your first time, we have two restrooms, let me just uh, finish this, give me one moment here. Yes. Is this it? Let's finish.